Okay, I have to admit, I'm having a little bit of fun today on this beautiful fall day. Just a slight rain coming down, but you know, this is a great time of the year to get out fishing. The bass are putting on a feed bag and it's a good time to go out there and catch some smallmouth bass and largemouth bass, and that's what we're gonna be doing on today's show. Glad you could join me. Coming up. On this week's episode, Bob shows some tactics and tools for catching late season bass. First, Bob uses a wacky rig technique targeting smallmouth bass in shallow on Lake Erie. Then he heads to Lake St. Clair for a more aggressive approach, flipping and pitching points and edges for largemouth bass. And later, Bob tours his Ranger boat, recommending his favorite onboard items and features when on the water. Oh, nice job. There we go, boys. Whoa! Look at that magnificent fish. Look at that. Isn't that sweet? Look at the size of that fish. I think I love it. Get him, Bob. Get him, Bob. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> the Real Fishing Show with Bob Izumi. <laughs> All right. That is a big rainbow trout, Chris. And the Bob Izumi pose. <laughs> That is awesome, girl. Yeah. <laughs> that is all right. Man, that is so cool. Look at the color of that. Isn't that something? Nice. Look at that chunk. <laughs> Whoa, baby. Real Fishing is sponsored by Mercury, number one on the water, and Tim Hortons. On the Real Fishing Show, we make catching fish like this a possibility. A jumper. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you know it's amazing because there's always smallmouth shallow um, in certain areas as long as that water temperature and the water temperature is in the 50 degree mark here today. And uh, look at that, that's a plump little guy there. That's a little fatty. Hit a gulp sinking minnow. And uh, one of the things I'm doing today is I'm, uh, I'm fishing out here on, on Lake Erie in real shallow water. And I'm just going for fish that a lot of people don't target this late in the year. They're, uh, most of the people are focused on deep fish and there's a lot of deep fish on Lake Erie, but, but there's also, a good population that stays shallow right through till about the first part of November. It's late October, we've got a beautiful day. We've got a good pair of sunglasses on here. I'm just looking, scouting the area, and I, uh, I'm ready to, to throw at any fish I see, but one of the keys is long cast, so. Let's see what happens. When we return, there's more bass action on Erie and items aboard just in case while on the water. Stay tuned. Closed captioning is brought to you by BoaterExam.com. Let's take a look down under with this week's Fish Eye View, sponsored by Mercury, number one on the water. It's common knowledge that steelhead favors salmon and trout eggs over anything else. So powerful is this drive to eat something small and round, they'll actually take split shot over a larger roll bag. Realizing this, tackle shops now carry a wide assortment of plastic bead imitations. It may come as a surprise to many anglers that all species of trout exhibit a preference for eggs. They'll pass over a more substantial meal in favor of a round object. Strange as it may seem, color isn't a big factor. This may serve to explain the effectiveness of ball head jigs. In our travels, we discovered even stranger things when filming warm water species. Regardless of color, bear jigs were sometimes more effective than dressed versions. We found that walleye everywhere really go for empty jig heads. But the action didn't stop there. Crappy showed equal interest in hitting undressed jigs. During a tough bite, they actually refused traditional bait in favor of an empty version. The reason for this behavior is childhood memories. 
Juvenile fish are opportunistic feeders. Eggs from spawning fish are a common and nutritious food source. Bottom line is, no matter what you're after, adding plastic or metal beads to the equation can really up your odds. Oh, yeah. Whoa, Mr. Fatty. One thing you want to match your tackle to what you're doing, and because I'm wacky worming today with this uh, five inch gulp sinky minnow, is oh, I got to get down there and lift this fish. Is I've got one of the new Fenwick Atos rods here, and uh oh, get off that trolling motor. There we go. <laughs> and Let's see if I can save that that bait. Oh, bait just fell. Oh, that's a nice one. Oh yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Just barely hooked in the corner of the mouth. That is a, a pretty chunky smallmouth right there. And what I'm doing is is really it's important to to match your tackle with the uh, the fish. Wow. That one there's probably four pounds. Very nice. You know, one of the things that's important is covering a lot of water with this technique. And I'll keep the trolling motor on medium to slow speed. Um, and I'll be fan casting constantly, just covering water. This is a technique that really anybody can do is wacky rigging because all of the, it's like fishing live bait. Look at that fat smallmouth. Oh yeah. And uh, one of the keys with this deal is that you wanna Keep the trolling motor moving, cover lots of water, and I'm fishing shallow. I'm talking about, about uh, really water that's one to about eight to 10 feet deep, and that's really it. I'm not, I'm not out uh, uh, real deep doing this. Look at that, just plucked right out. And here's the deal is, uh, it's just a little finesse wacky hook here. And uh, this is that green pumpkin party gulp sinking minnow. And I've got a, a fluorocarbon leader here, a 10 pound, 100% trilene fluorocarbon leader. And on this reel here, on this uh, Abu reel here, I've got 12 pound nanofill line. No stretch, cast a country mile. And a seven foot six Atos rod, Fenwick Atos. And the, the real deal here is nice long cast and you'll catch a lot of fish in shallow, clear water doing this. Okay, get the shades on. For more than 30 years now, I've depended on Ranger boats for hundreds of tournaments. In fact, that's what I love to do. And what I've got here is a Z520 Ranger. One of the things that always has impressed me is the fact that they've got a lot of dry storage you can take a lot of things with you just in case. You should have all your safety equipment on board, uh, fire extinguishers, flares, all the things according to your state or province regulations, as well as I like to carry a throw cushion. It's not necessary in all states and provinces, but just in case it's nice to have on board. I also carry a push pole with me. I've had this for a couple of decades and it's a three piece push pole I can put together. I move it from boat to boat for my tournament fishing in case I get in that real shallow water. I also carry a spare prop. This is a Fury prop. I carry this in a Coleman soft sided cooler just so it doesn't bang up the inside of the compartment with the sharp blades. Also, I've got an assembly, a, a hub assembly kit and a spare trolling motor prop. Now on my motor guide, I run a safari prop, a two-bladed prop in the weeds, and then a three-bladed machete prop for open water situations. Another thing I carry, my boat bag. The boat bag I've got here is a, a water-resistant Columbia bag, and in it I've got spare sunglasses, some Costas, I've got sunscreen, I've got my cell phone, some Navionics chips, um, spare hats, toques, gloves. I also carry 
a spare Columbia rain suit in a Ziploc bag. I'm in some pretty harsh and severe conditions when I'm running some of those big water tournaments and you just never know when you're going to get really soaking wet. Now I also have a tool bag here and this tool bag is, is pretty heavy. It's got everything. It's got every conceivable tool you can think of. It's got zip ties, spare stainless screws, nuts, bolts, duct tape, just in case. And last but not least, I carry a Ziploc bag with a little bit of toilet paper. You just never know. You want to be prepared. Coming up, flipping and pitching techniques on Lake St. Clair for largemouth bass. Stay tuned. This tip of the week is sponsored by Coleman, the outdoor company. Changing the lower unit for your outboard motor is not that hard and it's great preventative maintenance for those lower unit gears. Now what I've got here is some high performance gear lube from Mercury and just a simple pump. Very easy to do. I'm going to trim down the motor. Now on this Mercury 250XS what you want to do is, is take a size 10 socket and take out the bottom plug. Okay, there we are. I'm gonna take that plug, put it right there, take a screwdriver and take out the top one. And now it's gonna start to come out. Now I'm just gonna let this drain for say, uh, uh, oh, 15, 20 minutes, maybe even a half hour. As you can see, there's just traces of uh, a potential water in here. Not a lot, but it's got a little bit of discoloration. Even a drop of water in your lower unit can uh, discolor it, but that's not too bad. But if it's definitely milky, you want to change this before the winter because your lower unit, if it's got too much water in the oil, can freeze up and really break this. Now what I'm doing now is I'm pumping in fresh gear uh, lube oil and the whole key is is to keep filling it up um, until it comes out the top here and uh, it's going to take at least a liter plus of this uh, gear lube before it's full and the whole key is by leaving that top uh, plug out is that you want to make sure that all the air is out of there so I'm going to fill it right up to the top so it starts bubbling out and then uh, we'll be set. And it takes a few minutes of pumping to get this done. You can see now that it's gushing out of the top. And so what I'm going to do is put the top plug in and uh, I've replaced the washer on here. It's a good idea to replace the washer every time you change the lower unit oil. And it's just a small specialty washer that you can get at your Merck dealer. So I'm going to just thread this in by putting in the top plug first. You create a bit of a vacuum in there. Okay, so I'll pull this out now. That threads in. I'll just put the lid on that so it doesn't leak. Okay. And I'm going to put this in. Put your bottom plug in nice and snug and you're all ready to go. Uh, once I put the prop on, that is. You know, it's something else when you flip in there and all of a sudden you just feel that thump. And uh, that's not a big fish, but just <laughs> when you do feel it, it is amazing. I love it. And I think that, you know, anytime you're, move, you're, you're power fishing, but you're, you're fishing a bait like this and you're putting it into a spot and you're fishing it slow like this, when you do get it in there, that adding scent or an attractant like that gulp spray is definitely an advantage. I think a stinky bait's always going to catch more fish and it's 
you've got confidence, that's really a key. You can get it in there nice and silent. And I'm just hopping it out. As soon as I get it in there, I'm hopping it out. And I'm working about that five foot band of water from the edge of the reeds just out. Then I'm reeling up real quick. Fast retrieve reel. This reeve will hear 7.9 uh, to 1 retrieve. So it's really getting the line in quick when I want to retrieve. Come on, baby. Wrapped around that reed. Come on, baby. There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a nice largemouth right there. <laughs> yeah, that's a good largemouth right there. See the fat belly on it? That's fish that are feeding up this time of year. Very sweet. Okay, hooked right in the corner of the mouth. Come on out of there. Very nice. All right, back in there, baby. Now, one of the keys today is, of course, I think the rattle on the jig, you've got the uh, fiber guard here. And this is a, a Berkeley Gripper uh, flipping jig here, and I've got this craw fatty, a Havoc craw fatty on the back. And uh, the wind is really blowing in here right now. And what I'm doing is I'm just trying to, you know, be as quiet as I can and flip into as many of these reed points and pockets as I can. Now, I'm just going to ease the boat out a little bit. Of course, by doing that, I'm blowing out this area here. So I've just got to keep flipping ahead of the boat so I don't really blow out the area with the electric. Oh, yeah. Okay, you know, it's funny because they're just grabbing this jig and holding on like you wouldn't believe. Now, I'm using 65-pound test spider wire, which is a braided line. Look at that little black tip on its tail. And, uh, and this is a, a very heavy action rod. And the cool thing is this Veritose flipping rod here, it's uh, 7 foot 11 inches, but it's very heavy action, but it's not an expensive rod. Retail on this is right in that, say, $100 range. Not an expensive flipping rod, but what I like about it, with the nanotechnology, even if you get a nick in it, it won't break like traditional graphite rods. It's very strong and durable, and you need it for this type of fishing when you're fishing in this heavy stuff. Okay, keep mosey on down here. When we return, more real fishing action. And on the Ranger, a few of Bob's favorite things. Stay tuned. I want to take a minute and talk about a few cool items that I like on my Ranger tournament boat. Now, I love my tournament fishing. I've been doing it for a long time since I've been 15 years old. And this is a Ranger Z520. Let's start with the bow. Underneath the bow, I've got this Hamby's Protector, and it's an option that you can order right from the factory, and it's a rubberized type keel guard. So if there's no docking available, I can pull this boat right up onto a concrete or asphalt ramp. Pretty cool, you won't damage the fiberglass. Another thing I like to do in the console and also in the bow is to get my Lorentz HDS units built right into them so that I've got them handy. They're right there when I can use them. I also have ram mounts on this particular boat so I can actually use a secondary Lorentz unit off to the side. Now going back to the transom here, I've got a jack plate. This is an Atlas hydraulic jack plate that lifts the motor up and down. It's a Mercury 250 Pro XS motor. I like that both for performance, to get a few extra mile an hour, as also for getting in the real shallow water over, say, mud or sand bottoms. I can run way back in if I trim this up. Another thing that I've got on this boat is a power pole on the other side of the Merc here. Uh, when I was fishing with Bernie Schultz down at Lake Okeechobee, he had one on his boat, and I couldn't believe how well it worked, so I had to order one when I got this particular 520. You know, folks, these are just a few items that make my job a lot easier. 
I have to admit, flipping is one of my favorite techniques, you know, flipping and pitching. And, you know, you got a, basically a solid reed wall along here, but I'm looking for any irregularities right now. So any little indentations or little cuts, I'm just fishing the corners of them. So a nice pitch right into that little corner there is a good spot. And these fish are just sitting on them as ambush spots. Oh, there we go. Whoa, whoa, nice one. Oh, man, <laughs> come around. Oh yeah, that's a big bass. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about right there. I don't think I'm gonna lift this one. I think I'll bend down and get it. It's hooked good. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh man. That is a good largemouth right there. Whew. That's one of the things, folks, about, about flipping. You're always going to get the odd big fish, or in fact, a lot of big fish. Over the years, whether I'm at Okeechobee or even up here in the north, like on Lake St. Clair, some of the biggest bass are around the heaviest cover. All right. Flipping and pitching, match the tackle and the baits, and get in the heavy cover, and you'll catch fish just like this. All right. All back in, baby. That is a nice large moth right there. Look at that. Get later, big boy. Yeah, all right. <laughs> this is a big fish. That is a fish of a lifetime. <laughs> well, that is just amazing. Look at that thing. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was too cool. Oh man, what a fish. Look at that. <laughs>